These are the words of the covenant that the Lord commanded Moses to make with the people of Israel in the land of Moab, besides the covenant that he had made with them at Horeb. Well, this verse is a pivot point in the book. The Hebrews prefer to read this as being connected to chapter 28 rather than chapter 29, but either way, it works. This is pivoting. This is a conclusion statement saying that Moses has completed delivering that Deuteronomos, the second law, to the people. And now he's about to transition into an admonition to keep that law. So whether it is a, a conclusion or an introduction to a section hardly matters because it functions as both. Let me briefly ref, ref, uh, refresh your memory on the structure of Deuteronomy and what we've seen so far. Chapter 1 through 4, we had a historical and thematic overview of everything that had happened so far and everything that Moses was going to talk about. He ran through their, their wanderings in the wilderness, which we looked at in great detail in the book of Numbers. He talked about the enemies they had defeated, and he gave them that big call to keep this covenant that I'm about to lay out for you. So that's the overview. Chapter 5 through 11 is part one of this law, where he gave them general principles to follow. These were not so specific, not giving them, like, do not do this or do that. It was like chapter 6, where he said, the Lord our God is, is one, and you shall love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and strength. And, and kind of giving God's motivation behind the laws that he gave them. Then in chapters 12 through 26, the largest section here, this was part two of the law, and this one did include specific prohibitions. This is where we would have long chapters where you'd have a one verse or two of what to do in a situation. You might call these the application or the outworking of the principles that were already laid down. Now chapter 27 and 28 completed that, that law, as we just read in verse 1, including the consequences of it, the blessings for those who keep the law and the curses for those who do not keep the law. Now we get to chapter 29 and 30, which go together, where Moses is going to warn and adjure the people to keep the law. I've told you what it is. I've told you what the consequences are. Now please make the right choice. He's going to hold out the possibilities for them that even when things are going well, they'll never be going so well that they cannot go terribly wrong. And also, when things are terribly wrong, they're never so far off as they cannot be restored if you will obey. And these are some of the most famous verses in Deuteronomy with the call to make a choice. So I'm going to lay out before you life and death, just as when you enter that, that promised land and you have your first ceremony where you stand on one mountain for the curses and one for the blessings. That you've got a choice to make. And however you desire to integrate the sovereignty of God and predestination and all the rest of it into your theology, however you want to do that, it remains true that people have to make decisions. You've got choices to make. And those decisions will determine your experience and your reality. We've hit this theme over and over again in the book of Deuteronomy because it really is the theme of Deuteronomy. That if you choose to obey the Lord, it will go better for you than if you don't. But of course, there's this wonderful section we're going to read that the grace of God is there. For anyone who determines that today is going to be the day where I make a different choice, where I change course, where I turn from my wicked ways, then God's grace will be there to support you and lead you. And that's going to be the same thing that we have to do as well, to make the right choice. And if you've making all the wrong choices up to this point, or if you find yourself drifting in that direction, God is always right there to take you back if you will make a good choice. So let's read verses 2 through 15. And Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, so you can see how there are perhaps multiple occasions where Moses is speaking to the people, although it's all in the same context. Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, You have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land, the great trials that your eyes saw, the signs and those great wonders. But to this day the Lord has not given you a heart to understand or eyes to see or ears to hear. I have led you 40 years in the wilderness. Your clothes have not worn out on you, and your sandals have not worn off your feet. You have not eaten bread, and you have not drunk wine or strong drink, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. And when you came to this place, Sihon, the king of Heshbon, and Og, the king of Bashan, came out against us to battle, but we defeated them. 
We took their land and gave it for an inheritance to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of the Manassites. Therefore, keep the words of this covenant and do them that you may prosper in all that you do. You are standing today, all of you, before the Lord your God, the heads of your tribes, your elders and your officers, all the men of Israel, your little ones, your wives, and the sojourner who is in your camp, from the one who chops your wood to the one who draws your water, so that you may enter into the sworn covenant of the Lord your God, which the Lord your God is making with you today, that he may establish you today as his people, and that he may be your God as he promised you, and as he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. It is not with you alone that I am making this sworn covenant, but with whoever is standing here with us today before the Lord our God, and with whoever is not here with us today. So they're standing, remember the context, they are standing on the borders of the promised land, holding on to the first parcels of land that Israel actually owned for themselves. They'd won them in battle from these Amorites. They're about to enter the promised land. Moses will not be going with them. Everybody else from the wilderness generation, save Caleb and Joshua, has passed on. And these are Moses' final words to the people. And what he does is he reminds them of the story so far. This is very similar to what he did at the beginning of the book because he's trying to make the point, right? He reminds them of how they ended up in Egypt in the first place. Now, how did they? We studied this in Genesis that they sold their brother Joseph into slavery in Egypt. He rises up in the ranks to become second in command of Egypt. Then when the famine comes, they come to him and who delivers them but Joseph. And Joseph moves the children of Israel from the promised land into the land of Goshen in the north of, of Egypt, the Nile Delta. But as time went on, as generations passed, the Hebrews were enslaved by the Egyptians. We talked about this in the book of Exodus. Historically, we know that there had been a usurping dynasty of pharaohs who were Semitic in their ethnicity. They had come from the same land, the same area as the Israelites, when, called the Hyksos kings. When they were overthrown, it seems that this is likely the moment when the Hebrews were enslaved. Because what were they afraid of? That these Hebrews, who are not Egyptians, are so many, one day they're going to rise up and they're going to try to take back what their same ethnicity had before. In any case, whether or not that's the historical reconstruction, I believe it is, they were enslaved. And they began to call out to the Lord. So God raised up a man named Moses. And we all know the story of Moses. He goes back into Egypt, tells Pharaoh, let my people go. God smote Egypt with ten plagues. These are the signs that the Lord is just discussing here. That the frogs and the boils and the river turned to blood and the darkness and the death of the firstborn. Culminating, of course, after the exodus as they ran across the desert when the Egyptians chased them down and they were drowned in the Red Sea. As God parted those waters, the Israelites came across and the Lord drowned all of Pharaoh's men. You would think after seeing something like that, you're like, all right, uh, that's, that's enough for me. I love the, the last line that Pharaoh gives in the Ten Commandments movie. He comes back to, to Egypt and he says, his God is God. And it's like, yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's kind of the whole point. That this is the true and living God. All right, we're going to do what he says. But as Moses said, they have still not fully given themselves over to the Lord, despite all of that. That even right after this, they get to Mount Sinai and they begin to worship a golden calf. And they engage in debaucherous idolatry right there before the Lord and his holy mountain. They have been rebelling since the beginning. And, and here they are now, not in the promised land. Now, lots of comedians love to make jokes about how Moses couldn't navigate and couldn't take them through the wilderness. I realize those are jokes. But the Bible does tell us why they did that. It was judgment. Because they got to the promised land, they saw the, the inhabitants of the land, that they were giants, that they were powerful, and they said, I don't think so, we're going back to Egypt. And they say, we're going to choose a new leader, kill Moses, and return. And the Shekinah glory, the pillar of cloud and fire, had to intervene to prevent that from happening. So God sent them out into the wilderness, said, you're going to wander around until this generation is dead. And I'll start over with your kids. And the book of Numbers is a long list of all the times they rebelled against Moses throughout that wilderness wandering. And over and over again, God affirmed the leadership of Moses. And now we get to these people. 
It's been 40 years. And he says, not only did God do good to you in Egypt, consider what he's done in these 40 years. Your clothes haven't worn out. Your sandals haven't worn out. I don't know about the rest of y'all. I find I'm pretty hard on shoes. I don't know what I do. I, I'm not doing anything that seems out of the ordinary to me, but I feel like I burn through shoes. Like my wife has shoes that she's had like since before we got married and they still look, you know, in decent shape. I can't go like six months without my shoes wearing out. Try 40 years, 40 years. And they, well, what do they do for clothing? What do they do for shelter? God took care of it. He said, you didn't eat bread or drink wine. What's the point? I fed you with manna and I fed you with water from the rock. You didn't have to worry about where your food came from for 40 years. Don't you remember the shock when you moved out and you realized, oh, nobody's making supper for me. I got to go get it. And it's like, this is about to change for you guys. God gave them water. He gave them miracle bread that snowed from heaven every morning. All of this, he says, was to teach them who the Lord was, that God was a powerful and avenging God, but he also was a good father, a provider and a protector of his people. Then he describes the other way that God was with them, that they won these wars against the Amorites. You, you talk about Og, right? Og was the man that said needed an iron bed because he was so big and he was so strong that they kept the bed afterwards. They put it in the National Smithsonian Institute of, of Israel afterwards because you read the book. Yeah, you can go see it. Is it not kept there? And like, well, probably not anymore. But when it was written, it was. These, these mighty Amorite kings that had stolen land from Moab, the Israelites walk in and they crush these armies. And now they've got this land and it was so pleasant. It was a great land for grazing that it was given over to the tribe of Reuben and the tribe of Gad and half of Manasseh wanted to stay there too, which is more than God had originally intended to give them. What's the point? When God was with them and they did what he said, Things only ever went great. He's trying to make a point because he, he then begs them, please enter into this covenant and keep the commandments because every time you did it in the past, it went well for you. And every time you did it, it went poorly for you. And he says, this is not just for the people on this day. This is for every generation of Israel. They were reaffirming the covenant, which had originally been made at Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai, right? But he's, he's, he's not doing something different. He's continuing what happened before. But he's saying this is going to last for everybody that lives in that promised land. He's trying to remind them of the history so that they don't forget. Can you not agree that your life goes better when you're walking in God's ways? Life just goes better. And you, we say, why do we got to sit here and rehearse these stories over and over again? Because we forget in fact, the Bible warns us against that. Psalm 103, verses 2 through 5. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And when you're feeling grumpy, like I sometimes do, what benefits? Who forgives all your iniquity? Who heals all your diseases? Who redeems your life from the pit? Who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy? Who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's? Well, yeah, I guess he does do that sometimes. Yeah, he does. Forget not all his benefits. Look back on your life. What has God done for you? I love this new song we've been singing, What He's Done, right? Because it's about the cross primarily, but you can say it about your whole life. Look at what God has done. Haven't you had a time in your life where your health situation was just not working and God pulled through? I mean, we've got lots of stories we can tell. I'll just give you one of mine. I remember when Micah was a, a little boy, I mean, probably not even one, maybe one year old or something like that. And um, in the middle of the night, he spiked a fever really high, started throwing up, started screaming and crying. And we, we didn't know what was going on. It came on so fast. We were trying to get him up and get, get him to the hospital. But I said, before we do anything, let's just pray. Lord God, please help Micah to feel better in Jesus' name. And then I'm telling you all, instantly, he stopped crying. Fever was gone. Wasn't throwing up. It was all over. I wrote it down because I knew... <laughs> Later on, I'm going to forget because it happens so fast. But you, you forget how panicked you are in those moments. I guess that was nothing. It wasn't nothing when it was happening. It's kind of funny when you hear somebody dismiss something that happened in history. It's like, well, it wasn't a small thing for them, was it? What about money? God ever come through for you financially? Why do you testify that God like, gave you? Don't you have those stories? God gives you like, exactly the right amount of money. Y'all, over and over and over again, God has done this for me. Kat and I are at the point 
We're, we're a little, little more blessed now than we have been in the past, but where we just kind of stopped worrying about if we were going to make the bills or not. Because God just came through. Or like it'd be like, oh, surprise, you get three paychecks this month. Because it's one of those weird months where they do that. Or, oh, God, turns out you don't have to pay that for six more days. Or, hey, the Lord just wanted me to bless you and give you a card on Sunday morning. And it's exactly what you need. I mean, we just don't even worry about it anymore. Because God just takes care of it. But you go long enough where you're blessed and able to take care of yourself. Don't forget so that if it's maybe been years since the last time you needed God's provision, don't panic like you've never been down this road before. How about just what we call coincidences in our lives? Where the circumstances needed to break this way, and then they did. And nobody thought they would, nobody thought they could. Or it needed to break this way, and then it didn't, and it still worked out. Where you had a deadline. You ever give God a deadline? God, if you don't come in by this day, there, there's no hope. He goes, I raised my son from the dead after three days. I, I, I got this one, right? <laughs> he delayed on purpose to raise Lazarus from the dead because he wanted to build their faith, right? But you look back and the devil tries to convince you that stuff just happens to everybody. It does not. When I'm walking with the Lord, things go better. And I know it and you know it. Each of these blessings here, like for this wilderness generation waiting to go in the promised land, we've got to remember just this initial history. I mean, we can look to the cross. We can look to all church history and our family. Look back on what God has done. And remember that when you walk with the Lord, it goes better for you. And let that motivate you to walk with the Lord more. Let's look at verse 16. You know how we lived in the land of Egypt. And how we came through the midst of the nations through which you passed. And you have seen their detestable things, their idols of wood and stone, of silver and gold, which were among them. Beware, lest there be among you a man or woman or clan or tribe whose heart is turning away today from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of those nations. Beware, lest there be among you a root bearing poisonous and bitter fruit. One who, when he hears the words of this sworn covenant, blesses himself in his heart saying, I shall be safe, though I walk in the stubbornness of my heart. This will lead to the sweeping away of moist and dry alike, meaning it doesn't matter how good you got it, the Lord will come for you. The Lord will not be willing to forgive him, but rather the anger of the Lord and his jealousy will smoke against that man. And the curses written in this book will settle upon him, and the Lord will blot out his name from under heaven. And the Lord will single him out. I want to underline that. From all the tribes of Israel for calamity, in accordance with all the curses of the covenant written in this book of the law. And the next generation, your children who rise up after you, and the foreigner who comes from a far land will say, when they see the afflictions of that land and the sicknesses with which the Lord has made it sick, the whole land burned out with brimstone and salt, nothing sown, nothing growing, where no plant can sprout, an overthrow like that of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboim, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and wrath. All the nations will say, why has the Lord done thus to this land? What caused the heat of this great anger? Then people will say, it is because they abandoned the covenant of the Lord, the God of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt and went and served other gods and worshiped them, gods whom they had not known and whom he had not allotted to them. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was kindled against this land, bringing upon it all the curses written in this book. And the Lord uprooted them from their land in anger and fury and great wrath and cast them into another land as they are this day. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. So he's... he's Inviting them to choose life, remember, to make the right decision. The first thing he's going to bring up after the history to motivate them is a deterrent. Here's what could happen if you do not choose life. He reminds them, again, we're still kind of giving some background, of the detestable, he says, idolatry of the other nations. You know, in, in America, where we do not have this, we, we can tend to <laughs> idolize idolatry, or shall I say glamorize idolatry. You see it on TV, you see it in movies, you see like the best version of it painted. Oh, look at the architecture. Oh, look at the structure. You go to a place that actually worships idols, detestable is the right word. It's amazing when I went to Nepal and uh, if you saw the Doctor Strange Marvel movie, there's a temple that he goes to in Nepal in order to find healing for his hands or whatever it is. It's unimportant to the 
the plot of the movie is unimportant. <laughs> the point is the temple he goes to is one of the temples I visited. It's called Pashupati Temple in Kathmandu. And boy, that place never looked better than it did in that movie. They got a lot, of, a lot of nice shots of just sweep. Oh, it's so oriental. It's so wonderful. Oh, look at the prayer wheels. Oh, look at this thing. And, and it's like, yeah, but right over there, th those are the lepers that they get stoned so that they can take all their money at the end of the day. Oh, that's the place where they burn the bodies and throw the ashes in the water. And then they get down in the water and drink the ashy water because it's holy for them. Oh, that's where all the cows and the monkeys wander around and defecate all over the place. There's statues right behind where he's standing that are graphic sexual imagery of bestiality between one of their gods and an animal. And people come in and they worship these things. And they worship it with drugs and they worship it with the sacrifices and the blood and the, the ashes. And, but you put it on Hollywood and you put a nice filter on it, which they absolutely did because I've been there and I know what it looks like. I can't even imagine how somebody would come and see this place and say, yeah, this will work for our movie. Like the field scout should have been like, listen, we, th th we can't do this. It's supposed to be spiritual. I don't know what you call this. It is detestable. That's more than I wanted to say about that. But you've got to remember this. You know, especially if you, you know, if you like to watch like old fantasy movies or if you like to read novels or like science fiction and things like that, a lot of times they bring in like the mythology of a place. Okay, fine. It's not real. And I understand you're not worshiping. But don't let that in your heart get this sort of neo-pagan nostalgia that some people have. Those were the days. Oh, when we worshiped Thor, those were the days. Really, when we were scrounging around in the mud, those were the days? And Jesus came in and liberates us from all that stuff? Everybody always, well, they took our, our culture from us. No, no, they showed up with Jesus, and we took our culture and flushed it down the toilet because we found something better. Amen? So, detestable idolatry. But the warning comes against anybody that would go after that stuff, and he calls it a poisonous root. He's like, it's like you're planting a seed in your heart that's going to grow and it's going to be poisonous and it's going to make you bitter. He describes this kind of person who thinks he can hide his sin, but since he's still part of the congregation, God will bless him. You know, like how he says that he blesses himself in his heart. You can't bless yourself, guys, okay? Not realizing, as he said, that God will single him out. There are so many people that think they're getting away with this. I'm going to be in the church and then I'll fool everybody and they think, and I'll also fool God. You ain't fooling God. And you're probably not feeling, fooling as many people as you think you are, by the way. The Lord said, I'm going to single you out. Well, what, God's going to pay attention to my little life? Yes! He's omnipotent and omniscient. He knows everything and he can do everything. It's not extra effort for him to pay attention to whether or not you're a hypocrite. He expands this out, though, not just to one person, but the whole nation. And he reminds me of the curses we read in chapter 28 which were horrific to read through. He says, you're going to be scattered and destroyed like Sodom and Gomorrah, as well as Zeboim and uh, Adma, which was the other village that was destroyed there too. And he says, and when this happens, I'm not going to go through all the curses again. Basically, it means exile and destruction. All the nations are going to roll by and say, well, what happened here? He says, and they're all going to know. They're going to know that there was a God over this land. They chose to serve other gods, and that God kicked them out. Because everybody's going to know, you're going to be shamed. You know, we have this weird war on shame that we're going through today, where you shouldn't be ashamed of anything, even though sometimes you ought to be ashamed of yourself, right? But shame is deeply felt, and in this culture, it was especially deeply felt. How people perceived you mattered very deeply, and how people thought of your nation and your family and your culture. And the thing is, even to this day, this has gone, come true, isn't it? People say, what happened to Israel? Well, they crucified Jesus. And some people get really nasty with that, but they're not wrong. And then, you know, you see these, you know, Jewish advocacy groups and Israel and all this. They, they don't like hearing that. Say, no, no, it was because of this. They, don't make it spiritual. Well, the whole world knows what's up. Because yeah. Jesus said, or not Jesus, but Moses, right? The Holy Spirit through Moses said, everybody's going to look at you. You're going to be a byword. You're going to be cast off to the side. Everyone's going to know which is exactly what happened. In 722 BC, Assyria, the, the nation that would skin people, came to the northern kingdom and exiled them. They scattered them out throughout their, their empire. 586 BC, Babylon came in and did the same thing to the southern kingdom. Then in 70 AD, Rome came in and did it again. And every one of those instances was because of their rebellion against the Lord. 2 Kings 17, verses 6 through 8. 
This is a much longer passage that I could read, just shortening it for time's sake. This is right after the author narrates the exile of the northern kingdom. And then he gives you about half a chapter explaining why this happened. It says, In the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria, which was the capital city, and he carried the Israelites away to Assyria and placed them in Hala and on the Habor, the river of Gozan, and the cities of the Medes. And this occurred... Because the people of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and had feared other gods and walked in the customs of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel and in the customs that the kings of Israel had practiced. And there are some people that say, well, Deuteronomy was clearly written after this because otherwise the stories just match up too much. Or this was actually God speaking and he knew what he was talking about. Every prophecy in your Bible of the coming exile of Israel can be traced back to these words written here. People would say things to Jeremiah, how dare you say that we'll be exiled? And he'll be like, uh, Moses said it first. If we keep on like this, judgment's coming. You can look at a nation and know if they're in trouble, regardless of whether or not you've had a word from the Lord. A nation that walks in flagrant disobedience of Jesus is in trouble. But even as individuals... We've got to hear this. You cannot be the person trying to furtively hide in the congregation and keep your life secret so that you can continue in your stubbornness and your sin. It's a poisonous root of bitterness. Now, why bitterness? Isn't this interesting how Moses phrases it? A root of bitterness. Here's what happens. If you take a seed of worldliness, some sin that you insist in engaging in, or some relationship you insist upon maintaining, or some idea or philosophy that you refuse to let go of, and you let that take root in your heart, it's going to start to grow. It's going to become a bigger and bigger part of your life. And trimming it back is going to be about all the spirituality that you know. It's going to poison your heart with bitterness. Why? Because you will grow bitter that the thing that you love most in your heart is denied you by God. You'll get upset with the Lord, like Eve in the Garden of Eden, that God is keeping something from you. If you eat that forbidden fruit, it's going to be a forbidden tree in your heart. If you insist on allowing yourself to engage in a certain kind of lust, or allow yourself to engage in a certain kind of fantasy or drive or ambition for your life that you know is wrong, oh, I'd never act upon it, but you're constantly nurturing and watering that little plant in your heart, eventually that root's going to make you bitter. Because you're going to be obsessed with it. It's going to be all you want. You know God says no. Now you're angry at God. I've seen this happen over and over again. The clearest example I've seen of this is sexually, unfortunately. Whether it's homosexuality or adultery. Where people say, I, this is what I want. It's like, you can't want that. That's an ungodly desire. You cannot act upon it and you need to work to get rid of it. But people continue to nurture it in their heart, never intending to act upon it. And they don't understand why they're so angry. And eventually you try to talk to them and you're like, really, you're going to give up everything that Jesus did for you so that you can sleep with who you want? Sex is not that important. But if you let it grow up in your heart, it's a root of bitterness. You cannot walk around claiming the name of Jesus, saying, I'm going to heaven while you live like hell and think that God's going to be okay with it. He will single you out for calamity. James 2.17 says that kind of faith is dead. And Moses agrees. And Paul would have agreed too. There's no tension. There's no, no opposites in scripture. Like not, God doesn't handle fakes. Jesus didn't put up with hypocrites. He's not going to put up with you. And you see this very often. Somebody does something and, and breaks bad really hard. What happened? What, this, they, there's, they totally changed. No, not really. But that root that they planted in their heart is finally starting to bear fruit. That's why sometimes when you see somebody make a decision that's ungodly and you try to stop them, it's like they don't even hear you. Because they've been making that decision for years. And now they're finally ready to act upon it because the devil finally broke their will and broke their hold. Guys, don't nurture that root of bitterness. Don't do it. And verse 29 is a great verse that we could talk more about. But the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us so that we may do all the words of this law. What does that verse mean? <laughs> oh, you might have some of these questions in your heart right now. Well, why would God do that? Well, does God do that all the time? I want to understand more. Moses tells us God has not told you everything. What he has told you is enough that you should keep his word. 
We, we think that we are entitled to know everything. And then if I don't know and understand everything, then I can't believe. Well, where is that written? Jesus said you must have faith like a little child. It's very easy to fool a little child. Are we supposed to be foolish? No, but we're supposed to believe like a child believes. I'm smarter than that. I got degrees, man. Don't come at me. Don't you know I've studied? I'm a scientist. I'm a, I'm a thinker. I'm a philosopher. I take the time to learn. I don't just accept anything on blind faith. Then you will be kept out of the kingdom of heaven because faith is the only way to get there. Well, I need to know more. Well, nope. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. You have been given enough. Plenty of time to discuss secrets when you've accepted the basics. Chapter 30 now. So that's the deterrent. Let's look at the hope here, okay? Verse 1 through 10. And when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you, and return to the Lord your God, you and your children, and obey his voice in all that I command you today, with all your heart and with all your soul, no halfway with Jesus, right? Then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes, have mercy on you, and he will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. If your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will take you. And the Lord your God will bring you into the land that your fathers possessed, that you may possess it. And he will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring, so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, that you may live. Hear the call back to chapter 6 there. And the Lord your God, verse 7, will put all these curses on your foes and enemies who persecuted you. And you shall again obey the voice of the Lord and keep all his commandments that I command you today. The Lord your God will make you abundantly prosperous in all the work of your hand, in the fruit of your womb, and in the fruit of your cattle, and in the fruit of your ground. For the Lord will again take delight in prospering you as he took delight in your fathers. When you obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes that are written in this book of the law, when you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So Moses now offers hope. So he says, remember everything that God has done and keep the covenant. You don't want to end up like this, do you? You'd rather end up like this, wouldn't you? It's helping you track with the train of thought here. He says, when you are exiled, and it's a shame that he says it that way, isn't it? He's like, I, I kind of know what you're like. And if I had to put money on it, I'm guessing that this is going to happen at some point. But, he says, when that happens, if you cry out to God, you will be saved. He says, if you return, this is the Hebrew word shuv. It is often translated repent. That's exactly what repent means, which means to turn around. Stop going that way. Stop thinking that way and go this way. He says, if you do that, the Lord promises to restore your blessings to you. God even promises to restore Israel back to their land. This subject keeps coming up in our studies together. But it's so important to remember that the land that God gave to Israel is a perpetual and eternal inheritance. And as we engage in the, the politics of this right now, you know, it used to be a little spoiler from our podcast that we recorded not long ago. But it used to be that like to be a conservative Christian, there were a couple like political inviolables that we had, right? Against gay marriage, against abortion and pro-Israel. But there's been a shift on this. We're seeing a lot more people are way more reluctant to step up and just say, I am for Israel. When that is exactly what scripture tells us. And part of this, I think, is because there's been this influence from uh, a more libertarian crowd that has come over to the conservative side of the aisle. They're like, we shouldn't be helping anybody, least of all Israel. And then you've also got uh, the very left-wing idea, which is saying, well, Israel stole their land anyway, and they shouldn't be there. People use that that preposterous word genocide over and over again to describe Israel now, even people that should know better. But people ask me, why do you support Israel? Because God said that's their land. And it doesn't matter how far he exiles them, even at the uttermost parts of the earth, even if they went off and planted a colony on Mars, God says, I'm going to bring you back and put you here. We read it in Jeremiah 31. He said, if you can break my covenant with day and night, then you can break my covenant with Israel. I just want to make that point. I think most of us get that, but 
When they came back in 1948, that was of the Lord, in my opinion. They still need to repent, but I'm getting ahead of myself. The land promise is everlasting. And this restoration that the Lord has promised them is tied to the circumcision of their heart, which is language that the New Covenant and the New Testament picks up quite a bit. The circumcision of the heart tied to the restoration and the repentance of Israel. Jeremiah 31, that same passage I was referencing earlier, Jeremiah 31, 33, he's talking about the new covenant. Here's what Jeremiah prophesies. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. What days? The days when they're driven out and exiled and harassed and harried. The last days, we'd say. I will put my law within them and will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Now, we love the new covenant. We're all beneficiaries of the new covenant. But the new covenant, right after that's over, Jeremiah says, And then God's going to bring them back into their land in the last days. So this new covenant of repentance, Receiving the law written on the heart, the Holy Spirit does that, Ezekiel tells us, is all tied to the restoration of the land. And we've seen Israel return to their land from thousands of years ago. That said, this does not mean that everything they do in that land is approved by God. They still not acknowledge Christ as their Messiah. But what it tells me is, okay, certain things that need to be in place for the end to come are now in place. The Lord seems to be moving us in that direction, which is very exciting. But until they repent, they will be in danger. And in fact, the Bible prophesies that there will be another exile that Israel experiences when the Antichrist comes. Jesus tells them to don't wait. When you see the abomination of desolation, which Paul explains, when the Antichrist stands in the temple and declares that I am God and you must worship me, Jesus says, get out of there. Don't even go back in the house to grab anything. Don't, if you, just pray that you're not pregnant because you're going to have to hightail it and get into the wilderness. But Zechariah tells us that the Lord is going to pour out a spirit of repentance upon Israel in the wilderness. They will repent and weep for Jesus like you weep for an only son. And then Jesus will return, destroy their enemies, lead them back to their land and rule and reign from Jerusalem for a thousand years. So this prophecy that we see here in Deuteronomy, which was, is not only for the end times, will receive its ultimate fulfillment in the last days when Jesus Christ returns. That will be the fulfillment of all prophecy brought together in Christ. But this promise here, that I'll restore you no matter how far you've gone away, that is true for anybody who will abandon his wicked ways and return to the Lord. If things go better when you serve Jesus and Jesus singles you out for calamity when you don't, I'd say best get it together and repent and return. Say, so really, will the Lord accept anybody? He sure will. Ezekiel 18, verses 26 and 27. When a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and does injustice, he shall die for it. For the injustice that he has done, he shall die. Again, when a wicked person turns away from the wickedness he's committed and does what is just and right, he shall save his life. They were accusing God in this chapter of being unfair. And God goes, how am I unfair? If you, if you honor me, I honor you. If you curse me, I curse you. That's exactly fair. But most of the time when people say they want fairness, what do they want? Special treatment, right? No matter how broken and busted you are, even if you feel like you've been exiled to Mars spiritually, you can turn to the Lord and start over right now. Right now, today. Like, I don't really feel very special. It doesn't matter. The Lord is special. That tonight can be your night where you renounce that stuff and you start walking forward. This is not some trick of affirmation that Christians do. Where we say, you just got to speak it and just say that everything's okay and everything will be okay. No, you got to do it. You can't just stand up and say, I no longer go out and get drunk on the weekends. Wow, I feel much better. Oh, you might. But if you go out and get drunk this weekend, guess what? You shouldn't feel better. You've got to do it to actually repent. Repentance is when you get that root and branch ripped out. 
But he also discovered how hard it is to get rid of the deepest roots of a plant that you don't want in your yard. I broke the handle of... I broke the handle of a spade in my old yard trying to get this tree stump out. I cut it all the way down to this like, little nub, dug up around it. I'm sitting there trying to break it, right? And the, the shovel broke. So I said, well, we're going to buy a new shovel and then take the dirt and bury that thing and just <laughs> pretend like it's all, it's all okay. Last year, I uh, spent a lot of time clearing out a lot of brush from my backyard. A lot of y'all came out and helped me. Thank you for that. It was great help. But it's amazing. These big old bushes and trees that are gone... Like a few months later, you see a little, another little piece starting to come up. And you go, oh, let me pull that out. Oh, I can't pull that out. And then you dig a little deeper. And there's this whole big gnarly root ball in the bottom of your backyard. And you're like, this is, this is going to take a lot of work, isn't it? But that's what repentance is. Because if you don't rip the root out, what's going to happen? It's going to grow back. Those same feelings, those same behaviors are going to keep coming back. You know, there's a, a trend in the church now, that's subtle, but you still see it, where people want to really emphasize, listen, it's not a sin to be tempted, you just you don't do it. Okay, that is true. However, what we can do is we, let's, let's use the analogy of, of Adam and Eve in the garden. Say, don't eat the fruit of the tree. Okay, and then she picks the fruit. What are you doing? Well, he didn't say I couldn't touch it, did he? And then she starts to look and admire, wow, what a beautiful fruit. This is, is that, no, stop, Eve, what? He didn't say I couldn't smell the, the forbidden fruit. He didn't say I couldn't paint a picture of the forbidden fruit. He didn't say I could carry it around with me and, and start calling it Wilson. Like, he didn't say I could do that. I haven't sinned yet. It's like, yeah, but you're gonna. And we do this with our sin. Well, the desire isn't wrong. Well, you got to rip the roots out or it's going to come back. You've got to stop doing this. We've got to stop messing around with sin. Say, well, I know every time I hang out with that person, I, I end up doing something I regret. So I've got, got to really stop doing things I regret when I'm around them. <laughs> yeah, duh. Or you could just stop hanging around that person. Oh, but they're such a deep friend. There's the root. You're unwilling to get rid of it. You have now found something you are unwilling to do to get rid of sin. And that's where Satan is going to dig in his talons and saying, you can do everything you want, but here's where I'm going. And until you get rid of this, I'm not going anywhere. Don't you know that that's true? There are things in our life. Jesus said, if your right hand causes you to sin, chop it off and throw it away. If you've got anything that you're unwilling to do to deal with sin, guess what? It's going to stay around. But if you will let the Lord Jesus rip up that root, if you will turn away today, say, no, I'm not doing this anymore. If you need to make all those embarrassing phone calls and have those conversations and endure the teasing and the mockery and find a new way to use your time for crying out loud, do it. And the Lord will show grace in that moment. He will receive you and restore you and start to change you from the inside. But you must repent. You must repent. No matter how far you're scattered, you can come back tonight. Doesn't matter how, when you're listening to this, how many years it's been since I preached it, you can come back tonight. It's not complicated. It's renouncing the old way and getting back to Jesus. Verse 11 now. So he's, he's told them, here's your history. It always goes better. Here's how it could go terribly wrong. Here's how it could go really, really good. Let's look at verse 11. For this commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you. You might want to underline that because some of y'all are sitting there thinking, oh, it's so hard. It's not too hard for you. Neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend to heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. See, I've set before you today life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today, by the Lord your God by walking in his ways and by keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules then you shall live and multiply and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of it but if your heart turns away and you will not hear but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them I declare you to you today that you shall surely perish you shall not live long in the land that you are going over the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life. 
that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice and holding fast to him. For he is your life and length of days, that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob to give them. I would say this is the heart of the entire book of Deuteronomy. This is the point Moses is trying to make with all of these chapters. Choose life. I've set before you options. Make a good choice. He's explained everything's gone well for you when you serve the Lord. It can go terribly wrong or it could go really, really good. So please choose the good way. And he starts by saying that the commandment is not too hard. And it's not far off. By saying far off, meaning it's understandable, it's plain, it's not a mystery. There's no secret things. I always crack up at movies where like there's a priest that wants to reveal that we secretly know there's been aliens the whole time. And that's why we have the 68th book of the Bible or something like that. that, That's just not true. You have everything. It's right there and it's not that hard to understand. God has given you enough. But it's also not too hard. Because God is telling them to obey me, but it's all obedience based upon repentance and grace. It says, if you walk in obedience and stumble, but come and repent, then we'll be fine. But if you walk in persistent rebellion, guess what? Persistent destruction is going to follow you. We do this so much. It's so hard to serve Jesus. No, it's hard to do it halfway. It's hard to try to keep as much of the world as you can And follow Jesus. Yes, that's hard. That's why Jesus said, leave everything you have and come and follow me. It's a plain commandment. Do righteousness and you'll live. Do evil and you'll die. That's not hard to grasp. As they prepare to enter that land, Moses is reminding them that nothing is guaranteed. Well, I'm in now. I'm good to go. No, that's not how it works. You're going to have to live it out. You're going to have to obey you got to leave behind those old idols. And verse 19, it, man, that's a memory verse, man. I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life. We have to make a choice to heed the voice of the Lord. Now, here it would be very cheap and very easy to say, now we know that we don't really make choices, that God is sovereign and he predestines everything, so he only makes this statement so that we can kind of know what's right and wrong. I don't understand how you can read your Bible and believe that people do not make choices. Well, Because God is sovereign. Yeah, God is sovereign enough to let you make choices and still work out his will. People always say, well, what about this verse? What about this verse? What do I like to say? What about this one? What about the one right in front of you? Choose life. Not that you can choose life. I already chose it for you. No. Choose life. It says, and if you don't choose life, then you're going to die. You have to make a choice to heed the voice of the Lord. The brother of Jesus said in James 1, through 25, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, He's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in all his doing. He says, don't deceive yourself. Don't deceive yourself saying, I'm sitting here listening to Pastor Tyler preach a hard message and I said amen, so I'm golden. Don't deceive yourself. Are you doing it? If you're not, you should be shaking in your boots. It's not enough just to know. Oh, I know. I I know that Bible inside and out. You ever been sharing the gospel with somebody who was a reprobate, but they knew the Bible better than you did? Met some of those people in prison. They had no grasp of the truth of Scripture, but they knew their verses inside and out. It doesn't matter if you know it, pal. I met, you know, I went to Bible college. I meet a lot of those people. That's amazing. Oh, I went to Bible college. Like, really? And you're here. I've had that conversation before. It's not just enough to hear it. Well, I go to a good, solid Bible teaching church. Good for you. It's not enough. There will be somebody with all kind of messed up churches, with petty infighting and all sorts of conflict, and even some unsound doctrine and some weird wokeness thrown in there. That person, if they have their faith in Jesus, they will be saved before the person who sits in a gospel Bible teaching church and doesn't believe. 
Some of y'all didn't like that. Well, guess what? Salvation is by grace through faith, not attending the right church. So if you're not going to walk in obedience and repentance, I have no assurance to give you. It's also not enough to be able to explain it. The internet is full of this kind of Christian. They can tell you every doctrinal angle. They make it their business to find other people that talk about the Bible and jump into the comment sections and tell everybody how wrong they are and how stupid they are. And they pick out all the people doing it wrong, all these people you never even heard of, but we're, they're the next big threat to the church. And you meet these people and it's like, you have no love in your life. You have no kindness. You're not serving anybody. You just sit there and act like a Christian internet troll. Do you think God is pleased with you? He's not. You've got to do what God has said. Stop trying to pin your circumstances on somebody else. You are the sum of all your choices. That is very hard to hear sometimes. If you choose to walk in drunkenness, you are choosing death. If you choose to be deceptive and lie to people, you are choosing death. If you choose to walk in pride, thinking you're better than everybody else, having these smug little conversations with other people, as soon as you walk away from somebody, you got something nasty to say. You're choosing death. If you're going to let your anger be unleashed, if you're going to be a violent and aggressive person, you're choosing death. And if you're going to be lazy and indolent and indulgent and gluttonous, you're choosing death. You do any of those things long enough, it's going to catch up with you. That root will bear fruit. But everybody's got an excuse of why it's okay for me to do it. Sometimes folks don't even want to make excuses. They just want to get you off their back by making you feel bad for them. You ever come across this person before? You can't do that, man. Well, you just don't understand my situation. If you knew what I was going through. People try to bring their upbringing. Hey, man, you can't talk to your wife like that. Well, my dad was, was not a good man. Okay. You still can't talk to your wife like that. Well, you don't understand. Nobody ever taught me what's right. You're a grown man now. Take some responsibility. You've seen it somewhere. Or their temperament. I ran into this one a lot with, in uh, youth and especially college ministry. People were taking their Psych 101 classes, learning all sorts of interesting facts about themselves. <laughs> well, you don't understand. I just, I just have, a, I have this thing. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a this. See, they took their Myers Briggs or their disc test, and like, well, this is. Uh, I'm a, I'm a type this or that. So I really can't. Like, uh, you better. I'll never forget this. I had a kid that I loved to death, and if he's watching, I love you, my man. But it's still a funny story. Uh, he's doing much better now. But in in high school, he just was. It was constant fighting between him and his parents, and. You know, I sit down I'm like, man, you can't. You, he told me this story. I'm like, you can't do that. He goes, I can't help it. My counselor says I have oppositional defiant disorder. That's a real thing. Did you know that? Which I, that might just be code for bad attitude. But I, thought, I don't care what you have. You have a commandment from Scripture. You got the Holy Spirit. Do the right thing. The hardest people to counsel are people who have already been to counseling because they've got excuses. They've got diagnoses. Personal history. Hey, what are you doing acting like that? Why are you pushing people away? Well, because everybody else has hurt me. Well, you're doing the same thing to them. You are now perpetuating what has been done to you. Or society. There's no point in me paying attention to my personal life as long as there are still oppressed people in the world. Nice try. God's not going to ask you about the oppressed people in the world. He's going to ask you about your life. People blame the church. There's so many rotten churches out there. And sometimes churches go, yeah, I know. Don't talk about my wife and expect me to say, yeah, I know. We're the bride of Christ. Well, God, I can't believe in you because your church is terrible. I beg your pardon? That's my wife. I always knew when I was in trouble, speaking off to my mom when I grew up. My dad wouldn't say, what did you say to your mother? He'd say, what did you say to my wife? <laughs> oh, boy, I'm no longer in son category now. <laughs> People blame the church. I don't go to church because the church is full of hypocrites. All of them? You checked, have you? You're much better than all. There's no good churches anywhere. Well, it's probably some. Then what, then what is this then? It's an excuse. Or circumstances, right? I'll, I'll, I'll tithe once, you know, once this situation is worked out. No, you won't. If you don't tithe and you're down, you will never tithe when you're up. I promise you that. 
You gotta do the right thing, guys. This is such a basic message today. I was racking my brain how to make it more interesting all day long, but there's nothing else to say. Do the right thing, and it will go better for you. And if you do the wrong thing, your problems are gonna pile up. Don't blame God. Moses, at this point, has all but concluded what he's saying to the children of Israel, warning them, begging them, reminding them of the covenant truth. He's saying, please, I'm not going to be there to knock your heads together all the time. Just do it, please. Of course, for us, the covenant we enter to is that new covenant that has been inaugurated by the blood of Jesus. And we enter into it by faith. That Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died to take away sins and rose again to give us new life. When you devote your life to Jesus, you are doing more than just affirming a statement. You have to do that. But if you you don't do more than that, you're in trouble. You're committing your whole life to Him. And when you do that, your eternal destiny changes forever. The choice is really life or death, but it's eternal life or eternal death. Heaven or hell. Do you realize that you choose heaven or hell every day based on how you live? Don't say, well, the grace of God has got me. What did Jesus say? Or what did Moses say about the man that sits in the congregation and blesses himself? Heaven or hell. Eternal glory, new adventures with Jesus for all time, or eternal separation, darkness, and fire. Make the choice. It's an obvious choice, except when it comes time to say no to something you want in the moment. But 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. You might need to make a choice today, whether it's your first act of repentance or your hundredth. But we all got to be living in this attitude of choosing new creation and rejecting old creation. Day by day saying, Lord, I made wrong choices today. I renounce those choices. I repent of those choices. And I refresh my commitment to you. Well, how often can I do that? Didn't Jesus tell us to forgive each other of the same offense 70 times 7? You think God is going to be less forgiving than that? And doubtless you feel guilty, but don't let guilt stop you. If I'm offering forgiveness for free, don't say, I can't accept your forgiveness. I'm too guilty. What? What? The person who's guilty is the one who needs it the most. You can come forward and be blessed today. Don't leave your life up to chance. Don't leave your soul up to chance. Choose to follow Jesus. And you'll find that new life. Make that leap. Some of y'all have been waiting. to. You got some things that you know you got to let go, but you just like them so much. And you know you really would like to just let it go. Just do it. Say, forget it. I don't want this stuff. Until you decide to follow Jesus, you're going to be standing outside the promised land, grieving and raving and wishing. But if you make that decision today, you you, you charge across the waters at the head of an army with conquest ahead of you. Conquest of everything that that God and His sovereign providence has prepared for you. So choose life tonight. Tonight.